Today, it seems everyone is a photographer. Nearly every cell phone and tablet contains a digital camera whose image quality rivals that of high-end professional cameras. While said professional cameras continue to get cheaper and more accessible with every passing year, the act of casually documenting our daily lives has become so common that it's strange for someone not to have taken a photograph within the last 24 hours. But a century and a half ago, the photographic landscape was rather different. Photography was the exclusive preserve of professionals and wealthy, dedicated amateurs requiring bulk expensive equipment, and extensive knowledge of light, mechanics, and chemistry. Then at the turn of the 20th century, a visionary inventor and the company he founded took this esoteric art form and placed it in the hands of the average person, creating a brand new industry and forever changing our relationship with the photographic image. This is the story of George Eastman, the Kodak Corporation, and the democratization of photography, and Mr. Eastman's rather interesting death. George Eastman was born on July 12, 1854 in Waterville, New York, the youngest of three children born to George Washington Eastman and Maria Kilborn. In 1859, the Eastmans moved to Rochester, where George Sr. established the Eastman Commercial College. Soon after, however, the elder Eastman died and the college failed, placing the family under great financial strain. This forced George Jr., who was described as a not particularly gifted student, to drop out of school at the age of just 14 to find employment. At first, he worked as a messenger and office boy for various insurance companies, earning $5 a week, which is about $167 today. When this did not prove enough to support his family, he took a correspondence course in accounting and in 1874 was hired as a junior clerk at the Rochester Savings Bank, his salary tripling with this to $15 a week. Four years later, an event occurred which would forever change the course of Eastman's life. In that year, he planned a holiday to Santo Domingo in what is now the Dominican Republic. When a co-worker suggested that he document his trip, Eastman went out and purchased a whole photographic outfit. Unfortunately, the dominant photographic technology of the era was the wet plate collodion process, which required the photographer to coat a heavy glass plate in photographic chemicals, load them into a giant tripod-mounted camera the size of a modern microwave oven, and immediately develop the exposed plate in a portable darkroom. Tent. The required equipment was, as Eastman described it, a pack horse load and very cumbersome to carry around. Though in the end Eastman never actually made the trip, this experience started him on a lifelong quest to make photography more convenient and accessible to the masses. Fortuitously, just seven years before, English physician Richard Maddox had invented a dry plate process wherein glass plates were coated with a mixture of photographic chemicals and gelatin, which dried into a hard, waterproof emulsion. Dry plates did not need to be developed immediately after exposure, allowing photographers to leave their heavy darkroom tents and developing chemicals at home. Based on Maddox's innovation, Eastman began designing and perfecting a machine for mass-producing dry photographic plates, taking out a patent on the process in 1879. In April of the following year, Eastman leased the third floor of a building on State Street in Rochester and set up a small factory to manufacture and sell these plates to amateur photographers. This venture caught the attention of businessman Henry Strong, who in January of 1881 partnered with Eastman to form the Eastman Dry Plate Company. While the company did brisk business, Eastman was unsatisfied with his flagship product, finding glass plates too heavy and inconvenient for the casual photographer. He thus developed a flexible photographic film on paper backing, which was far lighter and allowed a large number of exposures to be carried in a single camera. Along with photography expert William Walker, who joined the company in 1883, Eastman also developed a special adapter to allow any dry plate camera on the market to be converted to his flexible film. To reflect this expansion of his product line, the following year Eastman changed the company's name to the Eastman Dry Plate and Film Company. Unfortunately, this new innovation failed to attract a wide audience, as Eastman later reflected. When we started out with our scheme of film photography, we expected that everybody who used glass plates would take up films, but we found that the number which did so was relatively small. In order to make a large business, we would have to reach the general public. The idea gradually dawned on me that what we were really doing was not merely making dry plates, but that we were starting out to make photography an everyday affair, to make the camera as convenient as the pencil. Towards this end, in 1888, Eastman released one of the groundbreaking innovations in the history of consumer technology, the Kodak No. 1 camera. Effectively a wooden box covered in leather, the Kodak came preloaded with 100 exposures on flexible paper film and featured a simple fixed focus lens, a rotating key for advancing the film, and a spring-loaded shutter activated by pulling a string and pushing a button. Once all the film was exposed, the user mailed the entire camera back to Eastman's factory in Rochester, which would develop and print the pictures, reload the camera with film, and mail everything back. An ultra-convenient process epitomized by Eastman's iconic slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. 
That same year, Eastman registered the name Kodak as a trademark and in 1892 changed the name of his company to Eastman Kodak Company. Though there has been much speculation as to the true meaning of the name, the truth is that Eastman simply created it out of thin air. As he later explained, the letter K had been a favorite with me. It seemed a strong, incisive sort of letter. Eastman and his mother thus used an anagram tile set to find the perfect K word, which Eastman insisted must be short, easy to pronounce, and different from any brand name currently on the market. Thus was born an iconic brand which, to this day, remains a byword for photography. Yet despite its catchy name, revolutionary business model, and smart advertising, the Kodak No. 1 failed to catch on, largely due to its price tag. The camera itself cost $25, which is about $800 today, while the film developing and printing service cost a whopping $10, a lot of money for the average consumer in those days. Undaunted, Kodak continued to innovate. In 1897, the company introduced the Vest Pocket Camera, whose telescoping lens allowed it to be folded up and easily carried anywhere. The camera also used rolls of transparent perforated celluloid film first developed by French inventor Emile Renaud but perfected and popularized by Eastman. The vest pocket would remain a bestseller for decades, being especially popular among soldiers during the First World War. Then in 1900 Kodak released its first blockbuster product, the Brownie camera. A simplified version of the Kodak No. 1 that sold for only $1, which is about $36 today. Unlike its predecessor, the Brownie featured removable film rolls, eliminating the need to mail the entire camera back to Kodak and allowing amateur photographers to develop their own pictures at home if they so desired. The film itself sold for only 15 cents a roll, making photography accessible to the masses for the very first time in history. Brownie cameras and Kodak film rolls sold by the millions, introducing the average consumer to the exciting new concept of the snapshot and creating an entire industry virtually overnight. The term Kodak quickly entered the popular American lexicon with the variations such as Kodaking and Kodakers and Kodakery, while amateur camera clubs and photography publications sprang up across the country. By 1927, Kodak had achieved a near monopoly over the American consumer photographic market and had established manufacturing and distribution centers in Canada, England, Germany, France, and Italy, and in 1930 was listed on the Dow Jones Industrial Average for the first time. Its Rochester headquarters, which came to be known as Kodak Park, expanded rapidly, sprawling into a 1,200-acre miniature city served by its own private rail line. Much of this astonishing success was thanks to Kodak's keen marketing sense, along with the classic, you push the button, we do the rest slogan. In 1888, Kodak introduced its iconic Kodak girl mascot, always dressed in the latest fashion and pictured in exotic locales clutching her trusty Kodak camera. The Kodak girl appealed to the burgeoning culture of women seeking greater agency and autonomy in everyday life. There was also a not insignificant element of good old fashioned sexism in these ads. After all, if even a woman could use a Kodak, then it must be pretty simple. Over the decades, Kodak would launch dozens of successful campaigns and slogans such as Prove It With Kodak, A Vacation Without a Kodak is a Vacation Wasted, and the legendary 1961 Kodak Moment campaign. They also sponsored giant colorama installations at New York's Grand Central Station, erected one of the first neon sign in London's Trafalgar Square, ran a highly popular pavilion at the 1939 New York's World Fair, and established Kodak picture spots at landmarks across the United States. These efforts succeeded in linking photography in the popular imagination with travel and cherished family moments, making vacation snapshots and family photo albums an integral part of the middle-class lifestyle. Another secret to Kodak's success was its perfection of the so-called razor and blades business model. By keeping prices as low as possible, Kodak ensured the widespread adoption of its cameras, whose users were then forced to pay for the film developing services and consumables such as film, printing, paper, and developing chemicals, sales which made up the vast majority of Kodak's profits. However, as we'll soon see, this once winning strategy would ultimately prove Kodak's undoing. For the time being, however, Kodak continued to experiment and innovate, releasing Standard 8, the first commercial home movie stock in 1934, Kodachrome, the first practical color roll film in 1935, the Ultra Compact Retina Camera series in 1949, the cartridge-fed Instamatic series in 1963, and the iconic Carousel Home Slide Projector in 1965. The company also produced photographic equipment for the U.S. government, such as aerial cameras for World War II reconnaissance aircraft, the cameras used by Mercury astronaut John Glenn on his historic 1962 orbital flight, and the film used by Apollo 15, 16, and 17 to map the surface 
surface of the moon. By this time, however, Kodak's visionary founder was long gone. You see, on March 14, 1932, George Eastman, suffering from lumbar spinal stenosis, a hardening of the vertebrae of the lower back, invited a few friends over to his house for them to witness the rewriting of his will. He made the decision to give a good portion of his money and prized possessions, including his enormous mansion, to the city he called home for his whole life, Rochester. To this end, he bequeathed his house and a $2 million endowment, which is about $40 million today, to the University of Rochester. Eastman also donated a large sum of money to dental dispensaries across the city, attempting to ensure that no child in Rochester would go without proper dental work. Finally, he left $200,000 to his beloved niece, Ellen. And if you're wondering here, when asked about his obsession with dental health, Eastman explained, I get more results for my money than in any other philanthropic scheme. It is a medical fact that children can have a better chance in life with better looks, better health, and more vigor if the teeth, nose, throat, and mouth are taken proper care of at the crucial time of childhood. In any event, cheerfully signing his will, he assured his friends this was just a matter of ensuring his wishes. Later, it was thought that he also wanted his friends to see him mentally alert so the credibility of his will would not be questioned. After all the T's were crossed and I's dotted, he asked if everyone could excuse themselves for a moment. When they did, George took out a paper and pen and wrote a note, which read, To my friends, my work is done. Why wait? G.E. He then took a pistol out from his nightstand and shot himself in the heart, ending his life at the age of 74. His ashes were buried on the grounds of Kodak Park under a marble monument that still stands to this day. Despite the loss of its founder, Kodak continued to go from strength to strength. By the end of the 1960s, the company employed 100,000 people worldwide, generated over $4 billion in annual sales, and was responsible for nearly one quarter of Rochester's economy. In addition to its ubiquitous products and financial success, Kodak was widely known for its treatment of its employees employees and its philanthropic work. The company ran extensive profit-sharing programs and offered its employees generous medical benefits and pensions, practices that were far from common for large American companies at the time. And when automation technology threatened to replace workers' jobs, Kodak either paid to have them retrained or waited till they'd retired to implement said technology to replace them. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. While by 1976, nearly 85% of all film and 90% of all films sold in the United States were made manufactured by Kodak, the once unstoppable company was beginning to face competition from up-and-coming rivals. Further, after introducing the Kodomatic Instant Camera, Kodak was hit with a $12 billion patent infringement lawsuit by the Polaroid Corporation and was forced to pay $925 million in damages, the largest such settlement in history up to that point. And by the 1980s, many photographers had started migrating towards rival company Fujifilm, whose products were around 20% cheaper than Kodak's for the same overall quality. The company suffered another hit in 1988 when, in an effort to diversify, it purchased the Sterling Drug Company for $5.1 billion. Unfortunately, the new division consistently lost money and was eventually sold off at a loss. But perhaps Kodak's greatest blunder during this period was passing on the chance to pioneer digital camera technology. In 1975, Kodak engineer Steve Sasson invented the charge-coupled device, or CCD, and used it and various parts lying around his laboratory to cobble together the world's first working digital camera. While the camera was bulky and took 23 seconds to record a single image onto magnetic tape, it nonetheless proved the concept feasible. Kodak's executives, however, were unenthusiastic, convinced that no one would ever want to to look at their pictures on a television set. The company was thus slow to exploit its technological lead, not entering the digital camera market until 1993. But these early cameras proved unprofitable, losing the company around $60 per unit, and by this time rivals like Canon, Sony, and Nikon had already pulled far ahead. In the end, the very business model that had built Kodak's empire would prove its undoing. For nearly 100 years, Kodak had made the bulk of its profits off selling film and development services and was unable to imagine a photography market without those key consumables. As a result, the company continued to decline throughout the 1980s and 1990s, managing to stay afloat by selling off patents, licenses, and brand names to other companies. In 2009, the company manufactured its last roll of Kodachrome film, while by 2011 it had fallen off the S&P 500 list of the 500 largest American companies. Finally, in 2012, the company which had brought photography to the masses filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. That said, Kodak still exists to this day, though it is a shell of its former self. With traditional film sales limited to a small specialty market, Kodak sold off its still film and branding rights to the Laris and Rito companies, which continue to sell film and other merchandise under the Kodak name. 
Meanwhile, the original Kodak Eastman branch has pivoted away from film and instead focuses on high-quality photo printers for home and industrial use. It also manufactures film stock for the motion picture industry and specialized products like x-ray film, antimicrobial coatings, and film for military reconnaissance aircraft. They have also recently diversified into the chemical industry, revamping some of their Rochester plants to produce fillers for generic pharmaceuticals. But while Kodak missed out on the chance to corner the digital market and maintain its status as a photographic giant, our modern snapshot and selfie-obsessed culture nonetheless owes a great deal to George Eastman, his humble but revolutionary dream of bringing the art of photography to the masses. Thanks to him, we all possess the means to capture 17 snapshots of the future poop that is our dinner to share online to nobody that cares and that will otherwise probably never look at again.